I think what they do is they must change it then in the calculation. So we'll take a look at it. Yeah, we'll, it depends on the lab. But what I'm going to say about specific gravity, so I'll do a little more investigation into that at the break. Um, so this is along the lines of when you check a serum osmolality, when we check your blood. High serum osmolality means you're dehydrated or you're hypertonic. Low means you're hypotonic or diluted. Same thing with the kidneys. This is what you're peeing out. If it's a high number, it's just a different thing. They, they do also do urine osmolality, but the high numbers mean you are very concentrated. Low numbers mean you're very dilute. So the lower you are on that scale, you're more dilute. So if you can imagine if your blood is very, very concentrated, your urine's probably gonna be very, very concentrated as well. So, all right, let's take a break and do 10 minutes and, or kidney stones. So there's always medicine terminology. It's always great. Um, calculi, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but urinary calculi is another word for stones and stone formers. And um, calculi is just basically like, like plaque. Think of it as plaque, urinary plaque, and it's urinary stones. Um, so the process of forming stones is called urolithiasis. Anything with uro in it has to do with urine or the kidney area. So um, anything uro, you can think kidney. And lithiasis is stone forming. So gallstones is cholelithiasis, which is fat stones, basically. And that's what... Um, so if you ever see the word lithiasis, that means you're making a form of stone. And then the front pronoun is kind of where it is. So cholelithiasis is in the gallbladder, and urolithiasis is in the kidney. Um, this is an amazing video, 100%. Sorry. Watch this video for the background to kidney stones, just for the sense of time. I'm not going to show it in class. I'm not going to show it in class, but I want you to watch this video. It really clears things up. Um, and basically one of its things is it kind of goes through and tells you the kinds of stones, but the fact of how the stones are actually formed. So I think it's really, really good, really important. And I love it. They call them stone formers. Like, like you chose to do this. Like you're a stone <laughs> former. It's very dramatic, but um, it's a very informative video on the background behind kidney stones. So it's only like three, four minutes. So it's worth your time to watch. So I would say go ahead and watch that video at home as you go back through this. Um, and they go through this, um, they go through the different kinds of stones, which I have later in the causes, um, but the different kinds of stones and how to prevent the stones from forming and what to teach your patient and stuff like that. It's a very good video. Um, but what do we want to know about recognizing it? So recognize it. Well, it's pain that comes in waves and fluctuates. So they call it colicky pain, just like a colicky baby is crying one minute, fine the next minute, crying one minute, fine the next minute. Colicky pain is the same way. It's fine one minute, and then it's like killing you the next minute, and then it's fine. It just comes and goes, um, and that is very typical. Any pain that is in your flank any pain that is in your flank is your kidneys. Your kidneys sit right above the small of your back on either side. So any pain that's in this area, we think of as kidney pain. Um, so the pain will be on the side and the back below the ribs. So back here on the side and the back, right below your rib cage, above the small of your back is where your kidneys sit. So if you're having pain there, it's probably kidney pain, um, unless you strain your back or something like that. But if you're having this colicky pain that comes and goes, and it's right here, um, they may consider it um, kidney pain. It sometimes spreads like a contraction. Pain can spread around. If it spreads around like a contraction, um, there may be that. And they may, you may have pain on urination as well. Um, pink, red, or brown urine. Why do you think you would have pink, red, or brown urine? Because there's a stone sitting in your tract trying to get down. Can you imagine what a stone across, like, a delicate little membrane, as it goes down, it rips the lining and causes bleeding. 
and causes white blood cell formation and causes problems. So pink, red, brown urine, cloudy or foul smelling urine is due to bacteria. So if you have cloudy, foul smelling urine, there's probably bacteria in your urine for whatever cause. Urgency, frequency. Well, your body's trying to expel a stone. So there it's going to be trying to pee more. It's trying to expel something. Um, and then incontinence means urine leaking around it because as it's trying to expel it, it's widening and dilating and trying to push it down and urine may leak around there. Um, how do we know if things are getting worse? So yes, you have pain, you've got an ultrasound, you've got a kidney stone. We're like, huh, that's too bad. That really stinks for you, you've got a kidney stone. How do we know if it needs to be intervened right away? How do we know if it's getting worse? If it's completely blocking your urine, that's our biggest thing. If this stone is completely blocking your urine from getting out of your body, you could end up in kidney failure. So we're gonna go ahead and put that as a worsening cue. If your urine output starts to drop, then we need to intervene. So just going back to when we talked about uh, the elagur elagurian, uh, uh -huh. disease, are you So yeah, if, put the definition of oliguria in there. So if your urine output starts to drop. But we really, that's your red flag. Keep your red flag at 30 milliliters an hour. That is a red flag for everyone, even the tiniest little lady. We should be putting out at least 50 an hour, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're an infant or a kid, 30 milliliters an hour is like your low tolerance mm -hmm. threshold, okay? What's the weight that allows you to put out 30 milliliters an hour if it's half a millilitre per kilo? 60, 60 kilos? So, I mean, maybe if you're really teeny tiny, you know, 60 kilos is right around 120 pounds. So if you're young, maybe, maybe 30. But I want you to start watching. Keep that 30 in your head, even though it's not the definition of oliguria. But even an hour of less than 30 could be a blockage that you need to watch. So it depends on uh, where you are, what you do. But that's not a solid definition. The definition of oliguria should be there. But you're not watching this for 24 hours. You're probably looking back, and you go in to empty the urine, or you you drain their urine hat and you're going in and doing your eyes and nose and you're like, wow, I've been here since seven in the morning and it's one o'clock and I only have 200 urine. And that's all they have peed and they said they've never peed. So if you've been there since seven and it's one o'clock in the afternoon, how many hours is that? It's six hours at 200 cc's an hour. What is that? Is that accurate or no? Did I come up with a good, huh? 33. So you're like, are you dehydrated? You should be probably peeing a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. And it might be something that will be a red flag to you. It's not something you're gonna call a doctor and be like, I have 33 an hour. But maybe something happened somewhere along the line. We need to do more investigation. It's a red flag. As soon as you get around this 30 milliliters an hour point, start looking for what's going wrong, okay? Because really they should probably be putting out more than that. If you're dehydrated though, you might not. Might not be a renal stone, but your patient came in with colicky pains, a renal stone on ultrasound, and they peed into their urinal at 10 or 11, and you just dumped it at one, and you're like, wow, it was 200. What have you peed since then? You're going to keep monitoring it because you're going to be a little worried. It's a red flag. As soon as you calculate something and it gets to be around 30 an hour, I want you to start watching your patient for their urine output. The other thing you can do to see if they're retaining urine is what? A bladder scan. That would be probably best, and that's under the intervention, is to scan the bladder and see if they're holding on to urine. Because if they're not, well, maybe they're just dehydrated. Um, upper urinary tract infection or kidney infection. So if this, uh, you know, it's kind of ripping up your ureters trying to get out, depends on where the stone is, but now you have an infected, you have a very, a wall that's very susceptible to infection. We have bacteria kind of living in that area all the time that love to claw up those tubes and look for a place to live. Um, if they do find a place to live, those bacteria, once they start multiplying, like to climb up the tube and find more places to live, and they can climb all the way into the kidneys. So if your patient starts to have fever and chills, that's a sign of the infection getting up into your kidneys. Um, so that's a worsening sign, and fluid retention due to kidney damage. So if you somehow miss the decreased urine output and your patient's starting to look a little puffy, hmm, 
maybe their kidneys aren't working very well. Maybe we missed something along the way. So hopefully we're not going to get to that point, but maybe they're coming into you where they've had our stone for a couple of days. They haven't peed since last night, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and they're a little edematous. I want you to take that patient as well. You're probably already in the worsening condition. Okay. Um, here are the causes, and remember we put the causes kind of down into the, um, into the treat your patient about it, because if we know what caused it, we can tell them how to prevent it. Um, there are three, three, four different kinds of stones, um, and some people just have too much calcium. My mom got a calcium stone because she was taking too much calcium supplement. Too much is a good thing, she thought. So she was taking too much calcium and dehydrating herself because she didn't want to get up to the bathroom because she had knee surgery and ended up with a giant stone that needed to be intervened on. And I'm like, Mom, you got to drink water. You know so, <laughs> I read somewhere, too, vitamin D, too much vitamin D. Because that will retain more calcium for you. So remember, your kidneys are regulating your electrolyte balance. If you're taking too much calcium or retaining too much calcium in your GI tract, your kidneys will sense that your calcium level is high. And what's it going to do? It's going to pee it out because that's what it's supposed to do. And so if it pees it out, it'll sit. It's, it's sitting in those tubules. And if you're dehydrated, if they get the chance to stick together, that's what makes stones. So usually this happens in a dehydrated environment that you have a large number of crystals or calcium or something. And in a dehydrated environment, they start sticking together, and then you end up with a stone. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of most of the stones are caused. You can see dehydrations due to most of them. And that's because you're giving those big crystals a chance to bind together into a stone. Um, so kind of know the reasons why, because then you can tell people what to not do. Oh, you have a calcium stone. Maybe you should hold off on the calcium, or we'll figure out why you are excreting so much calcium and things like that. And that video goes into a lot of that very well. Um, but here, let's talk about how we're going to treat it. So what will fix the problem of all these things? Well, first of all, passing it will get rid of the problem. So a lot of the times we're going to wait and watch and see if it passes. So the first intervention is to see if it passes. So we're just going to see if it passes. And if we're going to see if it passes, um, I should. So where's straight in the urine? So usually, to fix the problem, hopefully we'll let it pass. If it does not pass, what do we do to fix the problem? These three things. These are the three things that are going to fix the problem. We're going to physically have to go in there and get that stone. And you can go in there and do shockwave, which is where they send shockwaves at it and break it up into smaller pieces so they can pass. Um, they can go in and surgically remove a kidney stone, which is what my mom had to have done because it's so big. Um, and then they can go in with a scope and grab the stone and pull it out. So there's multiple ways they can get the stone. but. It would be nice. And so a lot of times the shockwave therapy is low. Um, but if you are having a blockage, they're going to move up to something pretty fast. Um, so fixing the problem, that's fine. That's what will fix the problem. But remember, the first step is really, let's see if it's going to pass. So how do you know if they know if it's going to pass or if they need to intervene? Hmm? The worsening cues. Or this ultrasound scan. They can look at the scan and say, that kidney stone is ginormous. It's never going to pass on its own. We're going to go ahead and intervene. So if you have a patient coming in with all of these things and they have worsening symptoms, we would want to go ahead and get them that ultrasound right away or possibly intervene right away. If they do not have worsening symptoms, we're still going to make sure they get the scan so that we can assess before worsening symptoms happen. We don't want to sit around and wait for you to get worse before we intervene if possible. So when you're talking about what will treat the problem, it's either watching it pass or doing these three interventions. But in order to tell if we need to intervene or not, they probably need that ultrasound. So one of the things that's going to be on your priority list is making sure they get to that scan. Or if they're having worsening symptoms, you may need to go straight to interventions. They might not want to scan it. 
They may just want to go ahead and do something. They'll just be like, fine, we're going to go in. But mostly we've got to get a scan so we know where it is. Because if they're going to go in there and aim shockwave at it or go in and get it, they probably need to know where it is. So probably high up in your intervention list on the other interventions is getting that scan so they know where to go. Okay. So if your patient's got these things and they're coming in and they have their ultrasound ordered and they've got a whole lot of things to do and the tech calls you and says, hey, we're here to get them for the ultrasound, do you want to postpone it? No, this is probably a pretty big thing. They need to figure out where it is and how big it is. So they need to go to that ultrasound. It's not going to fix the problem, but it's probably a pretty big, important intervention. Uh, what are your other assessments that you're going to do on this patient other than making sure that they get to their ultrasound? They're going to have a lot of pain medicine. Their first priority is pain medicine. <laughs> Very different priority than your first priority. Your first priority is like, let me see how bad the problem is. Let me assess your urine output. Let me, and they're like, give me pain medicine. And you're like, I know, I know, I know. I will get you pain medicine, but I need to. So their mind is 100% pain medicine. So if you can do things in real world concurrently, but is pain medicine going to fix the problem or make anything better? So if it is a priority, um, what do you do first? Give them their pain medicine or um, get the ultrasound? Oh, isn't this great? What do you want to do? I would go ahead and give them their pain medicine. Okay, go ahead and give them their pain medicine. Is the ultrasound going to fix the problem right away? There is nothing in here that is an immediate intervention that will fix the problem right away. Unless the doc is calling for them to go down for a uroscope right away. But even then, give them some pain medicine. Um, pain medicine is the patient's first priority. So we are sitting there thinking to ourselves, all right, what do we do? Are any of these things going to make a difference right now? Does it matter if we wait 10 minutes to give pain medicine? Probably not, because if we're watching and waiting, they need pain medicine to relax and pass it. If we're getting an ultrasound and we're doing treatments and whatever, they can probably, you can spare 10 minutes to give them their pain medicine. So I would go ahead and put it, even though it's not one of our priorities to fix the problem and usually we drop everything do the priority to fix the problem and then do the other interventions and in this one the pain is so severe for the patient that if they request it go ahead and give them their pain medicine um, and then um, the assessments we want urine appearance urine output pain level location temperature and what are we looking for with the temperature infection. infection because as that stone is coming down the tract it could rip things and cause an open wound for infection to fill. So we're always looking for infection. Um, and then if your urine output is less than 30 or oliguric, then we would want to scan and see if we're in a worsening condition. Um, in a patient with a normal urine output, is it appropriate to increase fluid intake to try to help it along? Yes, especially if you're in the watch and wait. Um, and you will not be going for these treatments if you're in a watch and let it pass. So there's really kind of a flow chart on this treatment. It's either watch and let it pass or a worsening condition, large size, and we're going for other kinds of treatment. But with both of those, pain medicine is appropriate. No matter which branch you're headed down, pain medicine is appropriate for both of them. And watching for worsening conditions is appropriate. Um, but yes, um, giving you extra fluid to help, de you know, pass that urine as long as you're watching their urine output because if you're going to increase their fluid, you want to make sure that it stays good because you could, because these stones could lodge at any point. Yeah. So watch their urine output. Um, patient teaching, once, you know, maybe if their pain's under control and you can start talking to them, um, there are... Um, things and here's encourage enough fluid intake to produce clear or nearly clear urine. I didn't put it in the interventions because I don't want you just assuming that you can do that because stones could lodge at any time. You can do that cautiously while watching urine output. Okay, but for patients going home with this, now they are considered a stone former. They formed one stone. They're at high risk for forming another one. Encourage them to take your their fluid, especially if they're elderly and they don't have a lot of drive to drink. A lot of fluid intake to produce clear or nearly clear urine. When you go and take a break, is your urine clear or nearly clear? If it's not, you need to drink more. 
Um, and then there's dietary changes for depending on which stone you have. So you will need to look at their labs and figure out what the stone, and they, that's why they want you to strain the urine to catch the stone so they can identify what kind of stone it was because we don't know what to teach the patient until we know what kind of stone it is. So you're probably going to need to watch some lab pathology reports to find out what kind of stone it is to know what kind of discharge teaching to do. So once you strain the stone, what do you think you're going to do with it? Send it to the lab. You'll probably have an order for that. And if you don't have an order for that, you might need to call and get the order for that. You're like, oh, I strained the stone. Now what do you want me to do with it? And they're going to say, oh, put it in a cup and send it to the lab because they want to find out what kind of stone it is so that you know what kind of teaching it is. So I'll let you read the teaching piece, but these are the different kinds of stones and um, what we would teach them about the, the uh, any questions on the foods and things like that? I'll let you read that. Well, it's kind of like shock therapy, I guess. I mean, roller coasters are nice and bouncy. That's all shock therapy is, is sending, it sends an ultrasonic uh, wave through there and breaks up the kidneys. So, yeah, could. Yeah, prescribed Cedar Point. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you got to go ride a lot of roller coasters. Um, yeah, but that's what they're trying to do is that yeah. if we're waiting and watching for it to pass and you're just taking pain medicine, waiting for it to pass, um, then, yeah, I mean, if you're going to go on a roller coaster ride, sure. But, but yeah, I wouldn't probably put that in the patient teaching, yeah. but it probably would work. Um, and then for evaluating it to make sure, we're just going to take our key assessments and make sure things are getting better. I mean, it's really not rocket science, but sometimes when you write it down, it helps you think things through. Um, so anyway, stones, key points is recognize it, know what you're expecting, pain, colic, um, possibly blood in the urine, things like that. And then we're going to um, watch for worsening, which is basically urine retention. And then we're going to treat it with either watching it, straining it, and trying to figure out the stone, or taking it for an intervention, and they'll send the stone off. And then um, we're going to make sure they get their pain medicine no matter how bad it is, because it hurts a lot. And there's the pain. And I, you know, you always hear the thing about, you know, men being like, oh, it's like childbirth. It's the men's childbirth if the men have it. Think about the fact that you have a stone scraping something all the way down. Guess who has a longer urethra? <laughs> Ouch. It's scraping up a lot more on the way out, and it does hurt. So we never want to minimize a patient's pain. Um, and on this one, we can put it as a priority because there really isn't much else we can do for it. So let's just treat the pain while we wait for it to either get broken up or pass. All right, infections. Just going through this real quick. These are words. So lower UTI. They are all UTIs. Everything, all the way up to the kidney, is considered a UTI. So I don't want to hear anybody say, oh, it wasn't really a UTI because it was in the kidney. Kidney is part of the urinary tract. Urine, kidney infections are a UTI. Um, so cystitis and urethritis are, the cystitis is cyst is a bladder, so anything cyst, cystoscopy or anything like that is bladder. So cystitis is an infection of the bladder, urethritis is an infection of the uh, urethra, hyalonephritis is an infection of the kidney, and glomerulonephritis is an infection of the actual glomerulus at the very top of the kidney. So those are the urinary tract. Also, you can imagine... These are go with all urinary tract infections. Um, so pain, urgency, white blood cells, red blood cells. So you can have a UTI with a kidney stone. It's a urinary tract infection. just means there's an infection in the tract. So if you have an infection, you're going to have white blood cells, and you're going to have bleeding because there's an infection in there. You may have leaking of urine. Um, you may have to wake up two or three more times a night to void because you're trying because it's it's trying to get rid of this bacteria in there as well. So you're going to be having a lot of urgency because the back, the kidney's trying, the bladder, the bladder's the one giving you urgency. The bladder's trying to expel bacteria. Um, so it's going to want to pee all the time. Um, worsening cues is when this urinary tract, whatever it is, gets up into the kidney. We are always focused on keeping bacteria and infection away from the kidney. Our kidneys are really important. You don't want it to get worse. And the cardinal signs of hyalonephritis 
are flank pain, fever, and chills. So if you've been having difficulty voiding, and now all of a sudden you're getting chills and kind of maybe some pain in your right back, then that means that it's kind of heading up into your kidneys and you need to seek treatment or you need more intense treatment. So the cardinal signs for pyelonephritis are fever and flank pain. Um, little old ladies that end up with UTIs and they have decreased sensation and stuff like that, they never, never find this flank pain, but they end up with a fever and chills. And they're like, you don't even know they have a fever. They just think they're cold and they're trying to stay warm. Little old ladies end up with UTIs all the time. And they don't really have any signs or symptoms other than the fever once they get this UTI because they have decreased sensation to their bladder. They've got decreased sensation to all this area. And their kidneys are already kind of old and decrepit with time. There's not a lot of, you know, backup kidney. And then you get an infection in there, so they get sick really, really fast. Um, but fever chills, so if you were having a UTI and you have fever chills, that's a worsening condition. Sometimes it's your first sign if you never knew you had a UTI because that means it got all the way up into your kidney and now you're having symptoms. Acute kidney failure, of course that would be worsening, but this means that this infection has gotten up into the kidney and maybe you didn't have a lot of kidney reserve and if you didn't have a lot of kidney reserve and this infection's in the one part of the kidney that was working, you could end up with um, acute kidney failure. And urosepsis, any area that has a lot of blood flow to it, that is a filtering organ, like the lungs, like the kidneys, like the liver, if you get an infection in them, you can get a bloodstream <coughs> infection very fast because these organs are involved with a lot of blood flowing by and exchanging things, so it can exchange bacteria. So kidneys, lungs, and liver are very high risk if you get an infection in there of getting bacteria in your bloodstream and getting septic, which is a bacterial infection in your bloodstream. Um, oops, wrong, wrong computer. All right. Um, e. coli is the most common pathogen. It lives normally down in this area. We always hear about E. coli infections making people really sick if you eat it. When, as soon as you get E. coli in your gut, E. coli loves acidic environments. Loves it, loves it, loves it, loves it. And it just multiplies in acidic environments. So if you eat E. coli, that bacteria is not killed in your intestine and multiplies very rapidly and makes you very sick very quickly. But it lives down in this area because it loves kind of that area. And um, it climbs up there at any chance, at any chance to climb up there and get you a UTI. Is, yes? Isn't that in our bowels anyway? Like, I thought that was part of our, like, the microbiome. It might be part, depending on your microbiome, but as soon as it gets out, it's controlled by other bacteria so that it's all living in, in, in harmony. But if one starts overtaking the other, then it starts to get a, the infection. So you add a more prevalent, and there's different kinds and more aggressive kinds and things like that. So... Anyway, E. coli is the most common one, but it's because it lives down there, at any chance it gets, it can get into a UTI, especially if you have a depressed immune system to kind of keep it under control if it climbs up there. There's, there's entryways. It can climb up there anyway. Um, so if you have diabetes, which is also a decreased blood flow to kind of those areas, um, or uh, a depressed immune system giving a chance to not fight off as soon as it climbs up there, um, poor perineal hygiene, so they always tell you, wipe front to back, because if you wipe back to front, you kind of just kind of put it all into the area and give it more of a chance to get up there. Um, retention or obstruction of urine. Anytime we have urine just sitting there, remember this E. coli loves acidic environments, it loves urine, it'll sit in there and grow in urine. So if it climbs up in there and then starts sitting in the bladder and reproducing in there, because it's like, oh, I'm happy and warm and moist in here, I'm going to reproduce, you can get a UTI pretty easily anytime you have any kind of retention of urine. Um, and females are more prone because they have the shorter urethra. So men, you suffer more with kidney stones, women suffer more with UTIs. So it's fair, right? And then, of course, whenever we're shoving a catheter up into that area, we are very high risk. You're taking the the natural organisms and just putting them in there and giving them a home. And they're like, thank you. We didn't even have to climb. Yes? What do you mean by reflux from water in urethra? Oh, so if the, um, I don't know, maybe I meant urethra to bladder? Yeah. I think I meant, 
or bladder to ureter. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, <laughs> reflux. so basically, if there's urine in places where it shouldn't be, the urine should really just be in the bladder, but if you have reflux up, mm -hmm. so if you're, I think this is supposed to be ureter. Sorry. I, I, that I think here. when I was reading it, that's, that's right, but it's like, because it comes through the sphincters, but if those sphincters aren't working right, you can have a reflux from your urethra back up into the bladder. So it's bringing the bacteria. So either way, but yeah, when, it, whenever you have upward flow of bacteria, so reflux of any kind, you can have reflux from the bladder into the ureters as well, which would be even worse because then it's headed right up to the kidney. So if you have a UTI in your bladder and then it refluxes up into the ureters, it's like, hey, thanks for the ride, and it's headed up the, up the coast. So um, anyway, we just want to make sure that those bacteria stay under control and um, we keep an eye out for them. Um, so glomerulonephritis. So we can have pyelonephritis from just regular E. coli climbing up the, up the pipes. Glomerulonephritis is not usually from climbing up the pipes because it would have to climb up into the kidney and then get through every single tubule and get to a glomerulus. Glomerulonephritis is usually um, caused by a uh, systemic infection. So glomerulonephritis, remember, is at the very, very top of that whole tubule system. Usually the infection doesn't make it all the way up to the glomerulus from the downstairs region. It's usually a systemic infection. It looks a little different. It's a little bit special. So I want you to treat glomerulonephritis, even though it's considered a urinary tract infection, I want you to treat it a little differently. It has different signs and symptoms. What were the cues for a regular UTI coming up from the south end. Fever chills were your cardinal worsening symptom, but urgency, um, difficulty burning in the urine, and pelvic pressure, and then cloudy white blood cells, red blood cells. This one is, looks a little bit different. They still have white blood cells, red blood cells, because it's still an infection. But the big difference between glomerulonephritis and the rest of the UTIs is protein in the urine. Because remember, this is where everything got off the bus. But now we're having trouble reabsorbing right in there. So protein got off the bus, but didn't get sucked back into the system. And remember, we don't normally want to lose protein unless we have an excess of it. And most people don't have too much protein. If you're on a keto diet, you may waste protein because we've got too much of it. But usually we don't waste protein. So we will find protein in our urine along with right blood, red blood cells and white blood cells. So in a regular UTI, you don't have protein in your urine. But in glomerulonephritis, you have protein in your urine. And um, it's got this bubbly foam cola-colored urine. And that is from the um, excess protein. So, um, and then the other cardinal sign, so if I could star three things, it would be proteins, bubbly, foamy, cola colored urine, I mean like dark, like Coke, like Dr. Pepper, like dark, foamy urine, and facial edema. Because what's happening if proteins are getting off the bus and we're not really filtering very well, we may start retaining some fluid. So those are the three cardinal ones that I want you to remember for glomerulonephritis. You will not have facial edema or cola-colored urine or proteins with a regular UTI. So if you start seeing any of those things, you might want to start thinking glomerulonephritis. They look a little bit different. It's an infection of the upper kidney. Um, worsening cues of this is acute kidney failure because this is our entry point. Our kidneys are not doing real well. So they could go into acute kidney failure much quicker. Um, in normal patients, if you just get someone with a, with a urinalysis with protein in it, you know, without red blood cells and white blood cells, that's a whole different syndrome. That's not an infection. That's just that we're wasting protein. So we'll talk about that one in a minute. But glomerulonephritis, proteins, dark foamy, and the facial edema. Okay. And then... The reason I kind of glumped it, clumped it all together is because the treatments are all the same, no matter what we do with them. But um, nephritic, nephritic syndrome, and the reason we call this nephritic syndrome, it's a kidney and it's an infection, but it's not a usual UTI. So they will call it nephritic syndrome. Glomerulonephritis and nephritic syndrome are synonyms. It's an infection, but it's not a typical infection. And the most common cause 
is strep. So, a post-strep infection. So if you don't treat your strep throat, you can end up with glomerulonephritis. So it is an infection, and so it has a little bit different. Regular UTIs are most commonly E. coli from perineal area, but glomerulonephritis is from strep. Strep has a lot of systemic problems, and one of the places a strep bug likes to live is in the glomerulus. So untreated strep infections are the most common cause. So if you have a patient where you get a urinalysis and you find protein and you find foamy, dark urine, and you have, um, what was the third one? Dang it, I forgot. Facial oh, facial edema. edema. Any kind of facial upper extremity edema or something like that, you may want to ask them if they've had a strep infection because it happens a week or two after a strep infection, up to a month after the strep infection. So maybe they had strep infection for a while, went and got it treated maybe two weeks into it or something like that, and it might be already went systemic. So ask them about a recent sore throat or a strep infection within the past month. Could you handle it differently? If, um, you would still cover it with antibiotics, like which we talk about the, um, when we talk about the interventions, but it's just a different antibiotic. Well, then what you would take for, like, strep throat? No. It's exactly the same. So wouldn't that kill it? If you got infection? treated in time, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Or but some people have a sore throat and just never get it treated. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a systemic strep infection, maybe the body got rid of it out of your throat, but it's, mm -hmm. it's spreading around. Mm -hmm. It sits in the heart, and it likes to sit in the kidneys. So strep causes a lot of problems. Um, so, oh, and then... Um, Nephritic syndrome is also, like if you don't have an infection, but you have glomerulonephritis, but they can't find the strep cause, they may call it just nephritic syndrome because they don't know where you're getting the glomerulonephritis from. Um, so they're kind of synonyms. Um, for glomerulonephritis, um, these are exactly the same. Oh, for all of them, yeah. Urinary tract infection and glomerulonephritis. Same, no matter, they look different, they appear different, they've got different sources, but the treatment is exactly the same. So that's why I kind of lumped them together. So you can do a card for glomerulonephritis and a card for the rest of the urinary tract system, but just because the cues are different, but the treatments will be the same. Um, the key assessments, of course, they'd be exactly what you think, intake and output, urine assessment, make sure that the urine is kind of getting better because as you treat them, it should clear up and there should be less red blood cells, white blood cells. Temperature, heart rate, respirations, fluid retention, all the things that we're gonna be looking for around the kidney if the kidney is worsening. Um, if we're going to give them antibiotics for their UTI, make sure you get your urinalysis first. Sometimes they're like, oh yeah, sounds like a UTI just from your symptoms. We'll go ahead and treat you and you know, we'll call you if the organism grows back something different than we expect. They expect E. coli and for, for glomerulonephritis, they expect strep. But if the urine grows back something different, they will send you a message and change your antibiotics. But those are the two bugs that they expect, and that's what they cover you with. But we need to, just like with any infection, we need to check their urine before we give them an antibiotic so that we make sure we get the bug before it got killed. Uh, so get a clean cut urine prior to antibiotic administration and make sure that they take a ton of fluid. What is the example, the exception to that? Well, if we already got a, a problem with the upper kidney where everything's filtering, you've already got facial edema, maybe not fluid. We'll hold the fluid on that one. But for most UTIs, it's flush, flush, flush. Get that bacteria out. If it's in the kidney, flush it downstairs. Get it out of the kidney and flush it down to the bladder. Move it out. It's flush, flush, flush. Um, the exception to that is glomerulonephritis. Don't give a lot of fluids to your glomerulonephritis patient with facial edema. Probably not the best. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. All right. Just want to make sure they aren't calling about the AC or something bad. Okay. Bladder scan as usual. Whenever you have a decreased urine output, if you have a decreased urine output, especially with a kidney problem, we want to make sure that we're not headed into the worsening condition of renal failure. So we want to scan the bladder, see if we're retaining urine, because if something's irritable or whatever, we might be retaining urine, but if we're not retaining urine and we're not making urine, ooh, we can just go ahead and say, whoa, we're probably oleuric and we're probably in real. So anytime they're oleuric, 
Um, go ahead and scan their bladder. If they're not putting out urine, scan their bladder because it's easy for us to rule out retention versus renal failure. But oliguric, whenever they're not peeing out a sufficient amount, we want to scan their bladder. So if they're headed into the worsening condition, this will help us distinguish is the worsening condition because of retention or because of actual renal failure. If there's nothing in the bladder, we're probably headed into renal failure. If there's something in the bladder, we might have retention. Maybe the swelling closed off the urethra, we have to look at that. So we always check the bladder when you're oliguric to make sure that you're either renal failure versus obstruction. Um, avoid unnecessary catheterization. But what's going to fix the problem? Antibiotics will fix the problem. But I would also add that your flushing will fix the problem too, will help us get rid of it. So you can put fluids and you can put antibiotics as what will treat the problem. Fluids and antibiotics. The exception to that is don't give it to glomerulus patients, glomerulonephritis patients, but give them their antibiotics. Take fluid off for glomerulonephritis, but keep it for, um, keep antibiotics for all of them. Um, they may be having pain as well, but it's not the priority of kidney pain. I mean, it's uncomfortable, but there are urinary analgesics that you can give, and we kind of go through the meds in a little bit. And blood pressure reduction for patients with glomerulonephritis, they're already having a problem with their glomerulus, their filtering system, we don't need increased pressure, kind of making the problem worse. Um, so anyway, what will treat the problem? Fluids and antibiotics. No fluids and glomerulonephritis. And then all the other interventions are making sure you get a clean touch urine before you get antibiotics, and um, bladder scanning if there's a worsening condition, and pain medication, and avoiding unnecessary cuts. So you see how we're kind of sorting these things out? Just because they're in one through six order doesn't prioritize them in order of importance because it really depends on what's going on with your patient. But what will treat the problem is fluids and antibiotics. The rest of it is all nice to know, good to know, and you should do them, but they're not going to fix the problem. Yes? So putting them the clean catch, is that just so that you're not treating it like it doesn't take not? Like Correct. I mean, the thing is, is that we don't know which of our rich flora down there got up there. We're assuming it's E. coli, but you could have other things in there. Um, maybe you have a vaginal infection that has gotten that bacteria up in there. There could be numerous things if everybody has discharged. You, we don't know what it's from, so make sure we get rid of any source from that area. And I mean, a lot of times SCD, STIs, or sexually transmitted infections, get up into the urinary tract too. So, because there's discharge from those areas, so even in men, even in women and men are prone to STI UTIs because they don't have as much just sitting down there, but if they're having discharge, then that can also get up in there. So, we don't really know what the bug is. We assume E. coli because it's the most common, but we want to make sure we get everything off the surface because then E. coli might come up positive and it wasn't really the source bug. Mm -hmm. So, we want to clean the whole area off and make sure that you're voiding out just urine from the bladder. So it's the same as cleaning off for a blood culture. You don't want skin bacteria growing in your blood culture because it'll give you a false positive. So that's what the clean catch is for. And, and you don't have to clean catch for a urinalysis. You have to clean catch for a urine culture, okay? Urinalysis does not have to be clean catch, but if they want to go ahead and take that and send it to the lab for culture. So usually if you're coming in with UTI symptoms, especially if you're working in the ER or clinic or something, they'll go ahead and clean catch the urine because what's it gonna hurt? It's not gonna hurt your urinalysis. But if they wanna take that urinalysis urine and go ahead and send it to the lab and it wasn't clean catch, it could be growing false bacteria. So make sure, and so most people will just clean catch the urinalysis. But just so you know, if you're just getting a UA from people, it doesn't need to be clean catch, only the culture. But usually it's UA, CNS, and that's a urine analysis and culture. So you would want a clean catch. Whenever it's a culture, clean the area first as best you can. And you would probably use what to clean the area? Antibacterial. Something antibacterial like chlorhexidine or something like that. Usually an antibacterial wipe to kind of get rid of that whole, that whole mess down there. Um, let's see. And then education for the patient once we figure out what it is. Take the whole course of antibiotics. Even if you feel better.
even mm -hmm. if you feel better. Because antibiotics work within two, three days to reduce the number, so your symptoms go down, but it hasn't quite killed off the whole entire infection yet. So take the whole course. There is research out there on that you can maybe stop taking antibiotics when your symptoms go away, mm -hmm. but that is not canon yet for us. Maybe it'll change in your time period, but for right now, they want you to take the whole course of antibiotics, so that's what you'll teach the patients. Um, if they're on IV antibiotics, they might get a couple doses of IV and then go home on oral. They just take their whole dose. Um, make sure that they pee. You want them flushing and getting rid of because retention is going to make it worse. So go to the bathroom every two to three hours and flush that bacteria out. And all the rest of it is just kind of hygiene. And yeah, there's cranberry juice, cranberry tablets. I don't know about that. Yeah, well, we're going through the meds, and that is there, believe me. I'm a big fan of Peridium. All right, genetic kidney disorders, just to go through those real quick. We're going to try and get you out of here for lunch at 1130. Um, the first genetic one is nephrotic syndrome. So we had nephritic syndrome, what's glomerulonephritis, that wasn't strep-induced, basically. Glomerulonephritis that wasn't caused by strep. Nephritic, it's glomerulonephritis, it's an infection but it's glomerulonephritis, and so it is nephritic with an I. Nephritic syndrome is an infection. Nephrotic syndrome is just a genetic permeability to proteins, meaning that we spill protein. So this is something where you have protein in the urine with no red blood cells or white blood cells. This is just an excess protein in the urine happens more with children and then they find out that this goes away as they get older that they become they kind of close up their system i'm not really sure how that all happens but high 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 amounts of protein in the urine we basically waste all of our protein into the urine with nephrotic syndrome so anything about nephrotic so nephritic and nephrotic we are wasting protein into the urine but higher amounts with nephrotic syndrome and no red blood cells or white blood cells in the urine. Nephritic syndrome being I with an infection has red blood cells and white blood cells. Nephrotic syndrome, and you'll learn more about this in peds because it is more of a pediatric problem. Um, people grow out of it, which is unusual that I've heard of, but my son's best friend has nephrotic syndrome. And um, anyway, high, high amounts of protein, urea, minimal red blood cells and white blood cells because it's not an infection. Um, and low serum albumin levels because we peed it all out. Albumin's our main protein. We peed it all out. And what did we learn about albumin? That is what keeps fluid in our bloodstream because we, it's our thick thing that keeps fluid in our bloodstream. So if we lose it out, what is happening? Where is the fluid going? Into the tissues. So a lot of swelling and tissue edema um, with it, and it's also associated with high blood pressure. Even though you're like, wait a minute, but think about what's happening. You lost all your protein. The fluid went to the tissues. So what is the blood vessels going to do in response? Constrict. Because they're trying to maintain a blood pressure, and so they end up constricting a bit too much, and it becomes habitual. So anyway, those are your key things, are protein, 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 but no red blood cells, white blood cells and they'll probably check a serum albumin level, and they'll be like, huh, you don't have an infection, and you got a lot of protein in your urine, and your albumin level is low. So you have nephrotic syndrome. Now, what would be the difference? Let's say you have someone who comes into you, 21-year-old guy, and um, he has high, high, high proteins in his urine, no red blood cells, no white blood cells, and they draw a serum albumin, and it's normal. He's on a high-protein diet because we can waste protein if we have an excess of it. So that differs from a normal patient that's on a high-protein diet versus someone with nephrotic syndrome is they have the low serum albumin. So do we understand how that's happening? You can have a ton of protein in your urine, and they're not going to immediately call it nephrotic syndrome. Oh my God, look at all this protein in your urine and you have no red blood cells, white blood cells. You have nephrotic syndrome. No, they need to confirm it with that serum albumin level. Because if you are just eating a high protein diet, your serum albumin is going to be normal or high. Because you're eating so much protein, 
there's no problems with your albumin. You got a lot of it, and the kidney's just doing what it's supposed to be doing and wasting the excess. So that's why we always <clears throat> say for the guys that are on steroids and ketos, we're like, you just got really expensive urine because you're taking all that meat and you're just peeing it right out because what the body doesn't use, it will get rid of. Um, so that is just a healthy patient that's eating, eating a lot of protein. So we would not worry about that patient. But if they come along with the low serum albumin levels, then that could be something nephrotic. Yes? Wouldn't it be the same thing? Like they come in and they know they've got it, and they're like, I just have a high protein diet, so I already know. Well, that might be something. We're like, okay. I mean, they may just not even do the serum albumin level if there's nothing correlating it. What do you think this patient would look like? How do they come into you? Puffy. Puffy. Very puffy. Are, is someone with just a high protein keto diet going to come in puffy and edematous? No. 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 So lab-wise, they have to correlate with low serum albumin, but you're going to see <laughs> the difference between a healthy person and an unhealthy person. Nephrotic syndrome comes in puffy because they've lost their serum albumin and now they are swelling out into their tissues. Does that make sense? So nephrotic syndrome is not glomerulus infection. It's just glomerulus wasting, so wasting protein. Um, what would we do for someone that is just wasting protein? Well, if they're wasting protein, you would actually probably want to keep them on a high protein diet. Oh, I yeah. yeah, this is for nephrotic okay. syndrome. Yeah, no, for your guys that are just peeing out urine. So they may have that foamy cola colored urine because they have a lot of protein in it, but it's okay. But for your puffy nephrotic patient, is puffy. Can't your kidneys to constantly be excreting that much protein? To just do like snacks? Like yeah, I mean, protein. yeah, we're probably not going to really. You know, really, if someone's not, if they're coming into you just for a regular physical, they're, we're not, they're not going to come in with a problem. And, you know, but it might be an ancillary finding on somebody who's coming in for the flu and if they did check a urinalysis. But I just wanted to show you the difference between a normal patient and a nephrotic patient. Um, but basically what they do for um, nephrotic syndrome is try to figure out what it is. A lot of times it's just genetic. And so what they will do is treat it with an anti-rejection drug because this is something that we're like, is, is there an autoimmune? They're thinking it's an autoimmune disease that is eating up the glomerulus and making it. Um, so they treat it with an autoimmune. They don't really know what causes it. They treat it with autoimmune. They treat the edema with diuretics and a low-sodium diet. And um, where's the other? Rejection edema, and they will treat high blood pressure because high blood pressure comes along with it. So they'll, of course, treat the high blood pressure. That should be kind of on there, too. We symptom treatment. We really can't really get to the cause of it. The only way, if they think it's autoimmune, if they put on steroids or um, an anti-rejection drug, that should block an autoimmune process, and hopefully it will get better. Um, my son's best friend is on tacrolimus, which is an anti-rejection drug. Um, and that maintains him not peeing out protein. So they are like, okay, it's autoimmune. If we stop the immune system from eating up the kidney, then you stop wasting protein. But um, as soon if he misses a dose or sometimes when he's stressed, like any autoimmune disease when you're stressed, then it flares up. He is 15 now. Yeah. He's getting up there and it still hasn't gotten better. So the thing is, is that this is, they don't know what it is. They don't know what the cause of it is. And so it's like treat underlying cause. Well, we don't really know. So they treat it as autoimmune. And if your protein levels get better treating it that way, then they the keep GFR, treating it that way. Everything's fine. It's just the protein, right? No, the GFR is getting worse. Okay, so, so really what we're looking at is if it does not go away when he's in his 20s, he's probably going to get a kidney transplant. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. But we don't know. Based on, you know, well, and I mean, will it attack a new kidney? Right. So nephrotic syndrome is something that they hope goes away, that and historically kids grow out of it. Mm -hmm. Autoimmune, maybe his immune system matures, it stops doing it. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting to watch this process with my, um, my son's best friend and, you know, like watching him. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're on this huge anti-rejection drug. But then if you get stressed or sick, you end up spilling protein anyway, so he kind of goes into the ER a lot when his swelling goes up and he starts spilling more protein. So, yeah.
Anyway, yes. How old are they when you normally find find out that they have that? Um, I think it's probably when they start puffing up and parents bring them in. I mean, you know, I don't know. It would depend on the age that it started. His was when he was four or five. Wow. Yeah. So he's been on antihypertensive meds and anti, you know, started out with steroids and then went to auto, you know, they had to ramp it up. So it really just depends. It's an autoimmune disease is what we're treating it as right now. So nephrotic syndrome, just wasting protein, we don't really know. So the treatment for nephrotic syndrome is anti-autoimmune stuff and symptom control, which is edema control and blood pressure control. Okay. Polycystic kidney disease is another kind of autoimmune. You just got bad genetic cards disease. Um, there's nothing we can do about it. If you have the gene, you have the gene. And what they will do, so for comparison, this is a normal kidney, and this is a polycystic kidney. Oh so it's kind of along the lines of if you have polycystic ovary, that's a normal ovary, but now it's got cysts all over it, and it affects the function. Polycystic kidney, same thing, cysts all over it. Do you think this is filtering well? Even though it's large, it is not filtering well. It is kind of... Um, and 50% of people end up with transplant or dialysis will go into renal failure. So what we do for a polycystic um, kidney patient is also symptom treatment and kind of helping them deal with it. But the thing is, is how do you know if you have it? Do you have a question? Yeah, I just have a question. I mean, even if they end up with a kidney transplant, you know, because of the gene mutation, are they prone to having that happen again, or is that their treatment? That's their treatment now. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that. I don't think it stop if they do yes. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's the way that their order. kidney formed. Okay. So it's not so. that there's no cure, but that is the cure. Is the well, cure. the cure is basically yeah, that it'll wait for it to fail, and then you'll have to either decide dialysis or transplant, depending on how happy you are. But how do you know you have it? The first cue is really these frequent UTIs and hypertension. These patients will be hypertensive. This kidney is just throwing renin out like there's nobody's business. It's just, it's just overworking. So it's throwing out renin. They have super high blood pressure. So, of course, you go in with super high blood pressure, but you got no other symptoms, and so they just treat you for blood pressure meds. So they give you blood pressure meds, and they get your blood pressure down. But this kidney is still cystic. Um, this also, they prone you to see the UTIs. Their complaints are lower back pain, Look how big they are. Would you imagine carrying those around? You don't have a tumor because there is so much room in your abdomen for extra stuff that it creates lower heaviness, back pain, kind of chronic flank pain, and then they may start having frequent UTIs because these things are not draining well. Urine's being retained up in the kidney. It might be frequent infections. So after a while, people start to go, huh, wow. There is no real test for it, but when they do an ultrasound to go, huh, when someone finally connects the dots, mm -hmm. and usually it's when you start having blood in your urine. Mm -hmm. Nobody really cares. The hypertension and headaches, they kind of go together. They treat that with hypertension meds. They're like, oh, you're hypertensive. And then they go there. And then you have frequent UTIs, and they're like, oh, well, clean better. You know, you're just having frequent UTIs. But really what's happening is this bacteria is getting trapped up in these kidneys, causing an infection. They'll treat those for a while. And then when you start having blood in your urine, they're like, huh, that's messed up. And they send you for a renal ultrasound. And then they're like, oh, look at those guys. They're really big. Yes? Can you palpate them? I was going to say, can you them? I don't know. That's a good question. It's a good question. I guess maybe if you have them down, it depends on how big they are. You know, I mean, these are obviously very far advanced. Probably takes a while to get that far. But um, I don't know if you'd be able to. I would think that anything that big, you'd be able to palpate it if you have them in the right position. Mm -hmm. Is the one in the middle a regular? That's a regular kidney. Yeah. Yeah. So three times the size. Yeah. Um, so you might also have constipation and stuff like that. Think about this big thing pressing in on your intestines, you might end up with some constipation. But very vague symptoms, and really it's not diagnosed until they get to an ultrasound. They're like, wow. Um, and really the treatment for it, there's symptomatic treatment only, no cure. They'll probably end up going to, they'll let it go until the renal function ceases and they'll have to pick dialysis versus transplant. Um, but the symptomatic treatment that we talk about is the hypertension treatment. Okay, so a polycystic uh, kidney patient, 
hypertension treatment, really, and just let them know, hey, this thing's probably not going to get better. There's no cure for this. It will probably progress to renal failure, and we'll have to, you know, that's a lot of patient teaching and talking. And then if they have kids, it's genetic. So, yeah. Is it dominant or recessive? I don't know. Honestly, I have no clue. <laughs> Did not think to look. <laughs> You're a scientist, right? <laughs> You've got a lot of good questions. I don't know the answer to that one. Okay. Yes. Um, this is just another sign kind of telling you the difference between nephritic and nephrotic because that kind of messes people up. But I like to remember the I for the infection, inflammation, and nephrotic is just wasting. Okay. So I think that's it. Oh, we talk a little bit about neurogenic bladder. Um, you've probably seen this word, this term. You'll hear it a lot more when we do neuro in block four. You probably may, I don't know if you talk about it in block one or two. Neurogenic bladder just means the sensation's not working. Something's not sensing that it needs to go. So it is either abnormal or absent. So when you have a neurogenic bladder, you can either have a spasming bladder or a flaccid bladder. Neurogenic bladder is either or maybe a combination of the two. It does not mean necessarily flaccid, doesn't mean necessarily spastic, you could have either one. So a spastic bladder is like, I don't know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna contract that muscle and you end up um, having you know, incontinence and frequency because that muscle's just going whenever it wants to go. And then um, you could also have flaccid bladder where that muscle never contracts and you just end up with your inner tension. Um, so we'll talk about the meds after lunch, um, there are a lot of meds for urine. So we will, let me see how much more. I think the renal meds is the end of this. Oh, and I have the urinary catheter thing, but yeah. So we have a little bit more to go on this before we go to renal. So, okay. So let me go back. Let's just plow through. Come on. Let me get you back. I don't know where you went. Okay. Uh, to answer that question, Anna, can I give you both dominant or recessive? Oh. Two different types? Okay. I would just refer them to a genetic counselor <laughs> because I don't know the answer. And it's fine to tell patients you don't know and do what you did, research it. But um, really, bring your, you don't have to know everything. Bring your referrals into it. Bring your, you know, bring experts into the situation rather than just trying to, you know, give them something off of Google. They can do that too. But I would say anyone with poly, you know, polycystic kidney disease that is facing dialysis transplant, I would probably send them to a genetic counselor to talk about, they need testing to find out if it's dominant, recessive, and all that stuff. So probably anything that is genetic like that and has no cure, we'd probably send them to a genetic counselor just so that they can know what they're doing if they have kids or how to counsel their kids and things like that. All right, let's talk about the renal meds. Hey, antibiotics. Well, these are the most common antibiotics, just in case you want to know, but all of them have pretty much the same antibiotics, but these would be the ones that we would prescribe. Um, you've probably seen um, the sulfas are very good against E. coli, um, so we would give those, but unless you're allergic to sulfas, and then they would put you, macrodantin is specific to just E. coli. Only E. coli doesn't work against anything else, but it's a great med for, um, for kidney infections if it's E. coli. Um, ampicillin, amoxicillin, cephalosporins, those are more broad. So we can give those for glomerulonephritis or UTIs because they work on all of them there. And then ciproflaxin also works really well against. So those are the most common ones prescribed for urinary tract infections or glomerulonephritis. Um, there is one urinary analgesic. If you've ever taken it and had a UTI, you will sing its praises to the Lord and you will be like, thank God for the person that founded this. You are my new favorite human. It is an anesthetic of the urinary tract mucosa. It only works in the urinary tract, and it takes away all the pain, frequency, and urgency, but it turns your urine reddish-orange. So that kind of freaks people out. I mean, really dark, mm -hmm. like, like bright, bright, like burnt umber, like probably like, I don't know. Might be scary to people. Yes, and it stains. 
<laughs> um, it is staying. So you just want to tell people who are getting peridium that yes, this will work. You will love it. But do not take peridium over getting treatment for your UTI. Mm -hmm. Because it is available over the counter now. Azo. Azo. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And there's all the women are like, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, if you take it, it will numb your urinary tract and you will lose the frequency and the urgency, but it does not treat bacteria. So what is happening while you're numbing your urinary tract and not treating your infection? It's just climbing up and up and up and up, and so you take azo for a couple of days or the peridium for a couple of days, and then you end up with a kidney infection. So always counsel someone. If they come in for treatment, you're counseling them and saying, make sure to take all your antibiotics. You can take peridium too for the first few days while the antibiotics are starting to work. But just know that if you have friends or anything that are counseling you, it's like, oh, I was having burning and I took the azo. And they're like, well, you might want to go and just make sure that that's not a UTI. Yes. With that, I mean, does every UTI need to go to the doctor for antibiotics? Or if you just blunt the pump, like, how If you can get it under control, if it is a lower UTI, you don't have plank and chills. If you need to, if you can, for the first few days, you can take azo and flush. But what I would say with anything that's anesthetizing you, that go a day without and see if your symptoms are really gone. Because in that period, you could be letting bacteria just grow and grow and grow. So just make sure. I mean, if you're healthy, take everything with a grain of salt. But if you're taking this analgesic, it should be either in combination with antibiotics or don't take it solely because it does not fix the problem. It's just a symptom treatment. So maybe something you might need to educate people on coming in with frequent UTIs. They're like, oh, I just treat it with peridium. It's over the counter. <laughs> That's just... That's just pain you control. You leave a proper specimen when you're on either. Um, I think that's the thing. Some of the doctor's office people in the rooms here and the LPNs, yeah. They, um, they're telling us now that that's okay, that you can come in with peridium. I'm trying to think, and like, it messes, because obviously the dip, they can see It the messes mouth. up the dip. Yeah, yeah, in the office when they do a dip, yeah. it, it, it messes, messes up your rapid, it rapid, messes up your rapid scan. So anyway, yeah, there are issues with it, but it is there. So your patient with a UTI could get peridium. And just know that it's going to stain your urine. So if you had a patient with a Foley that got peridium, it will come out bright red. Why is it over the counter? Why is it over the counter? It should it be? Because oh, it's a lower dose. I'm God blessed that it's over the counter because yeah. I'll take it until I can get to the doctor the next morning. Right. Um, Antispasmodics and alpha blockers. We will hear these a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot for many treatments, anything bladder related. So men with prostate issues will be on these. Um, anybody with a neurogenic bladder will be on these. Anybody with bladder issues. Um, if your bladder issue is incontinence due to spasticity, that detrusor muscle just contracts randomly throughout the day, and you have a spastic bladder, we will give it an antispasmodic. Um, and that will be usually these two um, oxybutin. I haven't seen a BNO suppository in a long time. They're old. They're old. Um, oxybutin is probably the main one. But there are, there is a suppository that will go in and kind of like just, control. you know, control that. But it's kind of, it's open. It's basically a narcotic. Mm -hmm. So a narcotic suppository is probably not the best choice because it causes constipation and stuff like that. So I think they've gotten rid of that, but you may see them around and older people might know about them. Oxybutin is the one we really use, antispasmodic. And then alpha blockers will relax the muscle around your urethra or your ureter. So it helps you if you need to pass a kidney stone. It will help it if you have a blockage problem like a prostate. So a prostate problem isn't going to cause bladder spasticity, but it's still going to cause incontinence and urgency and frequency. And so if you need to relax something so that urine can get by, then we'll use an alpha blocker. So you will probably see most of your um, prostate men or kidney stones on something like Flomax or Tamulosin because these are alpha blockers and they will just relax that mucosa, that smooth muscle. Okay, so there is a little bit of a difference in them. One's an antispasmodic and one will relax urinary smooth muscle and let things pass. So um, prostate, any blockage issues, blockage flow issues are usually the alpha blockers. Make sense? All right, then there's the diuretics. You've had these before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, I would probably, and I get them mixed up sometimes too, just know this one, the potassium sparing diuretic. Um, what do you think it's named? Aldactone. What do you think it works for? Aldosterone. So guess what aldosterone is? It's a potassium sparing diuretic. Aldosterone in, uh, well, no, it's not. The meds that block aldosterone are potassium sparing diuretics. Aldosterone itself, what does it do? Holds on to sodium and water. If it's holding on to sodium and water, it gets rid of potassium because, you know, it's just kind of all a balanced thing. So if it's pulling sodium and water in, it will excrete potassium. So aldosterone wastes potassium. So if we have an aldosterone blocker, which are, what are those two meds? That are ACE inhibitors and ARBs are going to cause you to hold on to potassium and waste water and sodium. So we could put, if you want to put, they're not technically given as diuretics, but one of the side effects of ACE inhibitors and ARBs is that you hold on to potassium and you will waste sodium and water. That's what we want if you're hypertensive, but you need to watch the potassium level on ACEs and ARBs because of what it does. Did you ever read that in your ACEs and ARBs to watch a potassium level? Hmm. Well, they do act as potassium sparing diuretics. But the full-on diuretics, um, just know these, if you, lupathiazide, any of these guys, will cause electrolyte imbalance and water balance. Electrolyte imbalance and water balance and potassium sparing diuretics will cause sodium and water to be excreted, but they do hold on to potassium. Um, there's just some education basically on diuretics. You can add those if you don't know them already. Um, this one I do want to point out as a list. I would like you to know these um, three big nephrotoxic meds. All right. Um, there are certain antibiotics or antimicrobials that are very bad for the kidney, that actually are toxic to kidney tissue. And those are um, the anthocyanin B, the myosins, the aminoglycosides, the vancomycin, gentamicin, tobramycin. They are bad for the kidney. They're very bad for the kidney. Um, some of the cephalosporins, um, could be bad at high doses. Some of the penicillins, most of the antimicrobials are not good for the kidney. They're processed in the kidney. They're toxic to the kidney and they hurt the kidney tissue. So we need to use them in consideration. If you are already having a kidney problem, we want to be very careful. And then they're like, wait a minute. You said cephalosporins and penicillins were the treatment for a UTI. Yes, they are, but just be careful. Knowing that they can hurt your kidney as well that you want to watch your BUN and creatinine with them. And you want to stop them and change them over to something else if your BUN and creatinine are high. Or if you're already in renal failure, or already prone to renal failure, or in the early stages of renal failure, they may weigh which one to give. Or maybe reduce your dose and make you on it for longer, okay? So antimicrobials, um, any chemotherapy agent, anything chemotherapy, it's just toxic, okay? Anything chemotherapy agent is toxic. And radio contrast media, so anything they'll give you for CT scan. So what do you think you're going to do if you're going to give someone something that is toxic to the kidney? Flush. Watch the BUN creatinine and flush it. Flush the kidney. And then you may need to rue it to lower the dose or avoid it if they are in further stages of renal failure. Okay, so know which ones they are. It doesn't mean you can't give them, but just know which ones they are, and if your patient's already in some stages of chronic renal failure or in acute renal failure, you will probably have to do a dose adjustment or avoid it. If you have a healthy kidney, go ahead and give them, but encourage your patient to flush or you will have to flush the kidney so that those toxic meds get moved and diluted. Does that make sense? So you may give them, but if in renal failure, we need to watch. And then these are also renal failure things that we watch because they will decrease blood flow to the kidney. The NSAIDs will do it because they block prostaglandins and close and make those vessels more constricted to the kidney. And then antihypertensive meds and diuretics 
they make your blood pressure lower. So decrease the flow to the kidney, right? They'll drop your blood pressure, they will dehydrate you. Things like that are not good when you're already having renal failure. So they are used with moderation and consideration in renal failure. So if you're in renal failure, this patient may be told to avoid ibuprofen. Okay. If you're in renal failure, they may adjust because they don't want your blood pressure too low. If a patient went into renal failure because their blood pressure was 180 over 100 for three years, and then we drop their blood pressure to normal, they're not getting flow to their kidneys. Their kidneys are used to that higher flow, and they don't, wait, they don't filter at a normal rate anymore. So we need to watch, and that happens to a lot of times when we're in the ICU, we have patients that um, now have a low blood pressure or they came in malignant hypertension, we put them on blood pressure meds and they drop their blood pressure, they go into renal failure because we dropped their blood pressure too much. So just be careful. My favorite, I think I will say this numerous times, my favorite intensivist says euboxia kills people. Just because it's normal doesn't make it right for everyone. If they've been living with a high blood pressure their whole entire life and you take away that blood pressure, we kind of take away that stimulus for filtering and flow that those kidneys are used to, and they actually will go into renal failure. So just use those things in caution, um, and just know what you're doing with antihypertensives. What, what did you say, those people? Euboxia. Trying to get people into the normal box. Oh, gotcha. Euboxia. I guess I haven't told you that one. I think I told block four. Um, but yeah, like basically trying to get someone who has been abnormal for months or years into a normal, can set their whole body into a mess. Mm -hmm. So just because they're abnormal doesn't mean it's something that we need to make go normal. Sometimes putting them normal throws their whole system off. So someone that's been hypertensive for a long, long time, we may want to bring them down to just the higher level, like 140 over 90. We don't need them to be 110 over 60. That may not perfuse their organs that are used to higher pressures. So just kind of keep an eye out. Or if the patient just can't be managed. So it happens with glucose patients all the time too. That you're like, oh, their sugars have been running 200. That's not okay. Let's get it down to 100. And they get down to a 90 and they like pass out because they're used to higher levels of sugar. So just be careful when, if you have chronic people that have been sick for a long time, we don't want to reduce their numbers to normal. We just want to reduce them to acceptable, and that's okay. Um, and then urinary catheters, if we have time, I will pull these up. I'll also leave them there over lunch. I do have a couple of things that I wanted to talk to you about urine catheters, about, about troubleshooting and things like this. Superpubics, I'm just gonna let you point it out. Care of the patient with superpubics is one of, your, one of your problem cards. I just want you to know the superpubic catheters, what they are, and any special considerations for them beyond fully they are prone to poor drainage, so you may need to move them around physically. Have them sit up. Patients laying flat on their backs with suprapubic catheters, they're going to have urinary retention. They're not going to drain. So these patients need to be turned on their side so they drain. So if you have a patient with a chronic suprapubic catheter, I mean, look at it sitting there. They're laying on the back. Is that going to drain? No. Heck no. They need to be laying on their sides to drain. So if that patient lays on their back for four to six hours, they're gonna have four to six hours of urinary retention, causing an increased risk of, um, of infection, and they're already highly prone to infection. They're going straight into the bladder. Um, nephrostomy tubes, I don't know if you've ever seen patients with nephrostomy tubes. These are drainage tubes that are directly into the renal pelvis. You can see a picture of it sitting in the renal pelvis there. Remember how much does the renal pelvis hold? Three to five cc's. So you can think the important thing about this is making sure it drains because any backup is straight into the kidney. And what do you think their infection risk is? Oh, super high. It's going directly into the kidney. So the important step of this is making sure that it stays continuously draining sterile, 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 clean. It's going directly into an organ. There is no white blood cell track trying to, there's no room for wiggle room. Infection will go straight to your kidney. So you would want to watch for kidney infection on these patients. And um, if you're gonna irrigate it to keep it flowing, don't push 10, 20 cc's of irrigation. We can irrigate a Foley by pushing like 20 cc's in there and trying to push stuff back into the bladder and get it moving again. 
Don't do that in an nephrostomy tube because it only holds about five cc's in that renal pelvis, so you don't want to flush it with too much. So just a little extras with the nephrostomy tube to think about. And then these are really just um, the surgeries, higher um, surgical interventions and how to care for the patient post-surgery. Um, most of it is common sense. But what are your problems after surgery? Infection and bleeding. After any surgery, infection and bleeding. And then, of course, we want to make sure that the organ that we actually went and did a surgery on isn't so inflamed and swollen that it starts to fail. So infection, bleeding, and failure, and that's what we're really looking for on these things. How will we know if they're bleeding? It's the kidney. So where are we going to see bleeding? All around your abdomen. And that is known as Turner and Cullen sign, if you have not remembered that or heard that or whatever. If you ever have a patient that has Turner or Cullen sign, Turner is like the T because your, your flank um, makes kind of a T shape. And Cullen's is the C around your umbilicus. So this is abdominal bleeding or flank bleeding. If any of that is happening after renal surgery, uh-oh, maybe your kidney's bleeding. Um, so you want to watch for that. Um, you may have blood in your urine. Some of it's expected. You just cut the kidney open. It's going to drain a little bit of blood and oozing. But if it becomes frank red or you see Turner Cullen's, you could have internal bleeding from your kidney. Um, and you want to watch, make sure it's not going into failure. Make sure your urine output is good. And if there's an occlusion of the catheter, how will we know the difference between occlusion of a catheter or that kidney is failing? We could flush it and see if it starts to go again. What's the other way? We could tell if the kidney is working and we just can't get urine out or the kidney isn't working. Huh? We can bladder scan. Bladder scan doesn't cost any money. It's very quick. It's very easy. We just ultrasound in the lab. You can do, try in clinical to do a bladder scan. Very easy. All you do is put a little probe there and boop, and it tells you how much is in the bladder. If it comes back zero or nothing, then we have a kidney problem. If it comes back 400 cc's, we have an obstruction of a catheter problem. So you kind of have an idea of where to go. Um, bowel sounds, uh, when they go in there and mess around with the kidney, anytime they pick up intestines and move them off to the side and work on something, whenever we move intestines around, you're at risk for an ileus. We'll talk more about the ileus when we do GI. Um, and because this is sitting, they sit kind of high up there. Whenever they maneuver around, they mess with the diaphragm and you can have some trouble coughing deep breathing. Every surgery, cough deep breathe your patients. Um, give them the center spirometer. Um, let's just talk to about urinary diversions. Urinary diversions are ostomies of the, of the urine system. For some reason, we had to remove ureters, bladder, um, something usually due to cancer. Um, if there are any kind of ostomy, means it's a tube to the outside. So usually they're called urostomies, because guess what they're producing? Urine. urine. Um, so urostomies, they can be all kinds of different kinds of urostomies. But the thing I want you to remember is they are either continent or incontinent. So an ostomy is just that there's something's been brought to the outside. Continent means that it has some control. You have control over how the urine comes out. Just like continent of urine means that you can control when your urine comes out. Incontinent means you have no control over when the urine comes out. So wouldn't you think that if everybody had a ostomy, they would want it to be continent, right? Mm -hmm. Usually. Um, but there are some pros and cons to each kind. Um, this is a continent urostomy. You see they make a little pouch. They make the pouch out of intestine. Because we've had to remove your bladder or something, so you have no more bladder. We've just taken a ureter and put it to the outside. So if we don't do anything with it, it's just going to drip urine as we make it. It's just going to pee into a little bag. Um, but they do have continent ones, which means we make a little pouch. And the important thing about a continent one is how do we get the urine out of there? It has to be self-catheterized. So do you think your... 80-year-old demented patient can take care of a continent urostomy? No. no. So there are pros and cons to it. Continent urostomies are usually only used for patients that are compliant, can learn to self-catheterize, and can actually do it cleanly. 
and efficiently because you can imagine what the side effect of a continent urostomy is. You've got urinary retention, so maybe you forgot to drain it. Does it have any sensation? No. no. It has no idea when it's full or not. There's lots of risks of reflux for it, lots of risk for infection. It's an opening that's just an opening. It's got a pouch there that kind of closes off on itself, so it shouldn't dribble. But some patients don't empty it until it starts dribbling, and they're like, oop, time to catheterize. That's not very healthy for it because we get a lot of reflux into the thing and you get a lot of risk of infections. Remember, retained urine, bacteria love to live in there. So we don't want patients that aren't going to take care of themselves getting a continent urostomy because they're at very, very high risk of infection and kidney failure or kidney problems with it. And they have to be self-catheterized. Otherwise, it'll just dribble out, but it won't ever empty unless you put a catheter into them. So if your patient has a continent urostomy, um, and they're known as all these different kinds. I don't know why most of them are states. I'm not sure if that's where they were born or whatever, but they're all known as some kind of pouch. So if they say something pouch, urostomy, or one of these weird names or whatever, something urostomy, like a Indiana urostomy, you're like, what the heck is that? It's probably pouch, and that would mean that if your patient can't do it, you will have to do it. You'll have to catheterize that ostomy. Okay, it's a continent urostomy. Um, the other thing is, is it's intestinal tissue, and so sometimes if the urine sits in there, it'll re reabsorb stuff out of it because it's an intestine. That's what intestines do. So if the kid, if the urine sits in there, it'll reabsorb some of that waste. So they do need to be self-catheterized, and they need to be taken care of. So if you have a patient that can't take care of it, I mean, you can see it looks a lot better. It looks like a little belly button, you know. It looks really cute. I mean, if you're going to have a urostomy and you can take care of it, that would be kind of preferable. You could just go into the bathroom, catheterize it, and be done with it. But, um, you know, they have to be able to take care of it. And then the incontinent urostomy is the one you're going to see more often. And those look like regular ostomies yeah. out under the tissue. And um, those will be, they just drain into a bag. Could yes? The stomas on the, the continent get infected? Like, do they need to be covered or um, it depends on how old they are, just like anything. The older they are, probably not as much. Because these pouches are not made with an outside ostomy like a urostomy. Okay. They're, they're kind of self-contained because they need to close themselves off so that you don't drain something out of that they're pouch. Not they're not as yeah. prone to dustiness <laughs> and things that you need to watch for. So you can see it looks almost like it's like a little belly button. They're very cute and they're very nice, and they're probably very good for someone who's young that had cancer or something and can take care of themselves and are very interested in how they look and things like that. A continent urostomy is a very good choice, but it is a high-maintenance thing. You're going to have to pee. You're going to have to pee for yourself every two to four hours. You have to know the signs and symptoms of a kidney infection so that you know when things are getting worse quickly because there's no more tract from the bladder up to the kidney. It's going probably straight back into the kidney. And um, just know to take care of it. So, um, and then incontinent ones are just going to be regular ostomies, but what's draining out of it is urine and it's going into a bag. And so that is something that is easier for caretakers to take care of or people who are not as compliant or aren't going to self-catheterize themselves, they can just go dump their bag in the toilet, put on a new bag, and be done with it. And there's not as much of a risk of infection because everything's draining outside the body into that bag. And as long as you can remove the bag and dump the bag, you'll be better. Um, so just basically some care of the stoma, which you should be repeat from block one, right? I'm not going to spend much more time going over that. But if you need a refresher, there's a nice... Um, thing on how to care for stomas. Okay, we made it. Let's go to lunch.